Uh, good day, stat students. So today we're going to go over chapter 7, probability. And this is long enough that we got to separate this into two parts. And so this is part one. And so let's talk about a random circumstance or what we call uh, a random phenomena. The, this book uses random circumstance, so that's where we'll start. Uh, so the outcome is unpredictable for some sort of event. Okay. And so uh, basically we have some sort of thing that's occurring. Okay. And, uh, and, but we don't know what the final result's going to be. So like we flip a coin, right? We flip a coin and we don't know if it's going to turn up to be heads or tails. And so uh, because we don't know if it's going to turn up heads or tails, to understand how often these, these random events occur, we assign probabilities to them, okay? So probability is the likelihood that a specific event will occur, okay? Now, I think the best place to start with probability then to understand it, okay, uh, is to talk about its properties, okay? But again, we have something that just, we have this thing that just occurs, okay? And we don't know what the final event, uh, uh, you know, outcome is going to be, okay? And, uh, and so we assign probabilities to these uh, events that start understanding them. So properties of probability. So probabilities are from 0 to 1. So I didn't say between 0 and 1. I said from 0 to 1. And so that means probabilities can be 0, they can be 1. Okay. And so now we know what values that probabilities can take on. Okay. What are the values that probabilities cannot take on? Okay. This statement also tells us that. That's just, just as important. Okay. So probabilities can't be negative and they can't be greater than 1. Okay, so if you ever calculate a probability and it turns out to be negative or greater than one, stop, you do it. You're, you're thinking about it incorrectly. Okay, that cannot occur. So if the probability of some event is equal to zero, the event will not occur. So let's go to the one extreme. Okay, there's the one extreme. And this is an absolute type of thing, is that if the probability of an event is zero, it will not occur. Okay, let's go to the other extreme. The other extreme says, okay, if the probability of some event is one, the event will occur. Okay, it's going to occur. Okay, again, another absolute. Okay, but most events do not have a probability of zero or one. Uh, zero or one, I should say. Okay, uh, they're somewhere in between. Okay, and usually we start with 0.5, and so we know that half the time that event will occur if it has a probability of 0.5 or 50%. Um, if the probability of an event is close to 1, say greater than or equal to 0.95, it will most likely going to occur, but it doesn't have to absolutely occur, okay? But it's probably going to occur, right? Probably going to occur, going to occur. The probability of an event is close to 0, meaning less than or equal to 0.05, it will most likely not going to occur, but it could. This is what we call a rare event, okay? So once it starts getting closer to 0, call that a rare event, okay? probably not going to occur, but it could. Like someone, I shouldn't say someone, but a uh, one particular win, uh, ticket um, has the winning numbers, okay? Not likely that any one particular ticket's going to have the winning numbers, okay? But we know it happens, okay? So rare events. How about two? Second prop property, probability. For an experiment, the sum of the probabilities of all non-overlapping uh, events is equal to one. Okay, and so let's, let's let's explore that a little bit. What are we talking about here? Well, um, let's say we flip a fair coin twice. Okay, what is the probability that we flip exactly zero tails, exactly one tail, exactly two tails? Note, notice these are all the possible outcome, final outcomes. I shouldn't say they're the final outcomes, but we can kind of summarize it like this. Okay. To actually get all the final outcomes, we can use what's called a probability tree to help us figure out these probabilities, okay? And so um, what we do with a probability tree now, the reason why I'm bringing up the probability tree now is because we're going to talk about this uh, in more complex situations, okay? And it's really good to start with a real simple example, okay? So think of this as the first flip, okay? With the first flip, either you can get what? Heads or you can get tails, okay? And so if you had 
three possible outcomes, you would have three lines here. If you had four possible outcomes, uh, you would have four lines. Okay, here we can just have the heads or tails on that first flip. Okay, what about the second flip though? Well, after we get heads the first time, we can get heads the second time. After we get heads the first time, we can get tails the second time, right? So that, those are uh, some possibilities. What about if we get tails the first time? Either we can get heads or tails the second flip. Okay, and so. Uh, what we can consider here is that is the second trial, or the in this case, the second flip. Okay. Now, if you follow the branches of the tree, okay, notice you follow those two branches, the two H's, okay, uh, at the end, you get two heads. If you follow these two branches, heads, tails. If you follow these two branches, tails, heads, tails, tails. Okay. And notice you have all possible outcomes now. Okay. Now, since the probability of getting uh, heads or tails is the same for each trial, so what I mean by that, let me get my pen out, is that over here, probability of getting heads or tails on that first flip, okay, is what? 0.5, okay? And since they are the same as we go through all these flips, okay, that since it was a 50-50 proposition right from the beginning, that once we get to the end here, um, that since we have four possible outcomes, that each one of these had a one-fourth of a chance of occurring. So that has a one-fourth of a chance, this has a one-fourth of a chance, because there was four possibilities here, okay? So the chance of any one of those occurring is one out of four. Now, you, now let me take you to this sentence here. When the probabilities for each outcome are not the same, we will consider what to do about that at a later time, okay? So you can't do that if, say, uh, this is 0.4 and this is 0.6, okay? Then you can't just go to the outcome and say, okay, well, we got eight different outcomes and, and it's one out of eight for each one. No, you can't do that, okay? But here we can, okay? Because we start out with the 50-50 proposition right from the beginning. So um, let's see, the probability of getting exactly zero tails then, meaning that uh, we got two H's, all right? Um, like I said, that was one out of four. Okay, so 25%, 0.25, however you want to think of it. How about the probability of getting exactly one tail? Well, there's two possible outcomes for that, either heads, tails, or tails, heads. And each one of these has a one-fourth of a chance of occurring. And so you add those two up, okay, and you get this two out of four, or if you want, if you will, one out, one out of two. I uh, hope no one's shaking in the, you know, at home right now watching that that I didn't reduce it down to a half. I want to leave them all as over four because I want to add them up in the end. So uh, how about the exactly two tails? Well, one out of four again, right? And so notice, these are all the possible outcomes. Here's the, all the probabilities. If we added all those up, what are we going to add up to? One, right? I'm going to add up to one. So that's what I mean by uh, once we got all the possible outcomes at the end, we look at the probabilities, we add up all the probabilities, they add up to one. All right, let's talk about sample space. Uh, sample space is a list of all non-overlapping outcomes for an experiment. The, uh, the symbol that we give the sample space is a capital S, capital S. Now, lowercase s, we know is the sample standard deviation, okay? And so, We've got to make sure that we use a capital S here, okay? So here's an example. We flip a fair coin once. That's the sample space. So either you could write it like this, but often the way we like to write it, so notice we could either get heads or tails, right? But we also write it with like this box, okay? And with the different outcomes inside the box, and we put a capital S in the corner to represent here's the sample space. Here's the final possible outcomes that we could have. Okay, either H or T, right? Okay, example number two, we flip a fair coin now twice. What's the sample space? And so we saw that there was four possible outcomes there, right? There's our four possible outcomes based upon our probability tree. Well, we can put it also like that, like a diagram, right? We can put it as a diagram and show the sample space, okay? All right, events. Events are usually given a capital letter such as A, B, or C, okay? And uh, for this example, let's say we flip a fair coin twice. And let's define 
event A, it's going to be exactly two tails. Okay, and let's let's go ahead and make up the sample space then. All right, so we have our um, I don't know if that's a perfect uh, square or not, whatever. Um, but we got our box there with a, with a capital S in the corner, and there's our four different outcomes, four different possible outcomes in the end. Okay, and here is event A. Okay, and I have event A there, and I drew a circle around it. Okay, to represent that. Okay, and what we call this generally is a Venn diagram. Venn diagram. So Venn diagram is going to help us quite a bit as we through, move through this chapter. How about complements. We have two non-overlapping events that cover the entire sample space. Okay, so we have two non-overlapping events that cover the entire sample space. So a different symbol for uh, a complement would be the following. So this would represent the complement of event A. So this book uses A with a C in the corner. So this would be the complement of event A. Now some books also use capital A with a bar over the top of it, or even using the words not A to represent the complement of event A. Okay. So let's say we flip a fair coin twice, and we define A, event A, as getting exactly two tails. Okay, so we know that. We've seen that before. All right, so what would be the complement of A? Everything on the outside. All right, so the complement of A is represented by the area outside the circle, but still within the box sample, uh, sample space. All right, so A complement of A. Now, since the probability of A plus the probability of its complement is equal to 1, that means we can figure out if we know the one, we know the other. So if we know the probability of A, we know what the probability of its complement is. If we know the probability of its complement, we know we can figure out what the probability of A is, okay, by doing a little subtracting from 1, okay? Because remember, these are uh, th this is covering the entire sample space, entire sample space. Okay. So let's say that we're still going to flip a fair coin twice, and we'll say let event A be getting exactly two tails, let event B getting at least one tail. So now at least one tail means what? One or more. One or more. So let's keep that in mind. All right, at least one means one or more. So here's our sample space, right? And here's our four possible out, uh, final outcomes, all right? And let's represent event A. There's event A, okay? But now we're going to have to represent event B. Now these overlap, right? Because notice uh, at least one means one or more. So this event, this event, and that event right there. Okay, those are all what? Event B. Okay, so this is what, what we mean by overlapping or non overlapping. These are overlapping. Okay, now look at poor, good old HH out there, right? Poor old HH, it's, a, it's outside event, events A and B, but remember, we still have to represent it because we've got to represent the entire sample space somehow. Okay. So how about, uh, let's go back to probabilities a little bit. Probabilities should always be thought of in terms of a relative frequency that happens in the long run, not the short term, but in the long run, okay? So for example, let's say we spin a wheel that is divided even, even this is supposed to be evenly, sorry, evenly between four numbers, one, two, three, and four, okay? And so we know that the probability of getting one should be, uh, 25 percent, probability of 2, 25, 3, 25, 4, 25, okay? Uh, however, however, let's say we only did this 50 times. Remember, we only did this experiment 50 times, and 1 is spun 12 times, 2 is uh, spun 10 times, 3, 15, 4, 13, okay? Does that mean the probability of 1 is, instead of the 25 percent, it's 24 percent, and 
probability of two is 20%, and probability of three is 30%, probability of four is 26%. No, no, absolutely not. Why not? Well, we didn't do this over the long run. We only ran the experiment 50 times, okay? So let me show you something. Uh, oh, but I was going to get in Excel. I was, I was thinking this next uh, slide was supposed to be Excel. Sorry. Let's talk about the law of large numbers, and then we'll get into the Excel spreadsheet, I think. So the law of large numbers tells us the following. If we run an experiment many times, technically an infinite amount of times, the exact probability will be experienced for that particular event. Okay? But you got to do it in the long run, not in the short term. Long run. Okay? Not in the short term. So here's my Excel spreadsheet. Now I got to get out of this for a second. And uh, let's see here. Oh, I got to click on this, right? It's not clicked on yet. There we go. Okay. So uh, notice what I've done here is that uh, this column right here is randomly generating either a 0, 1, uh, excuse me, uh, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Okay. So it's either randomly generating a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4. And, um, uh, and it's doing it in these cells right here. Okay. And it's doing that 10,000 times, okay, 10,000 times. And then what I did was is that every time a three showed up, I started counting how often uh, a three shows up, okay. So let's take a look at our our graph right now, okay. So this is 0.25. If that's hard, kind of hard to see, that's 0.25 right there, okay. Notice in the short term. Notice in the short term. Let's say let me uh, let me hover. Oh. No, oh, I kind of screwed up there. There we go. Let me hover, hover over this. So if I hovered over this, uh, if we only did this experiment 306 times, in this particular instance, uh, the probability of three showing up turned uh, was only point. Uh, I shouldn't say only, but it was it was too high. It was 0.268, right? If we take a look at the right here, 0.11. So we ran the experiment 11 times. Probability only turned up to be 0.182. Okay. But notice. If you do this over the long run, where is it? Where is it flatlining? It's flatlining right around 0.25. And I only I did this 10,000 times. Okay. Now, do I expect uh, after 10,000 times that I'm going to get exactly 0.25? No, actually, I'm getting around 0.254. Okay. I got to do this a lot more times to experience exactly what 0.25. Okay. So if I did this again, let's say I change this to an eight. Okay, and it's going to randomly generate new numbers. So it randomly generated new numbers. Okay, where's it flatlining around? Again, it's going to flatline around what? 0.25. Okay, and uh, there we go. There's some new numbers again. Where's it flatlining? 0.25. But in the short term, we have these fluctuations. Okay, so we got to be careful. But we got to think about probability in the long run, not in the short term. Okay. Okay, let's get back into let's see here. There we go. So let's talk about mutually exclusive events. Uh, they're also called uh, disjoint events. Actually, the book might actually use disjoint events every once in a while, but for the most part, I think it uses mutually exclusive. These are events. Uh, events are mutually exclusive if they do not have any outcomes in common. So, for example, if we roll a six-sided die once, okay, um, and we'll define uh, A as rolling an odd. So what's going to satisfy that? Either rolling a 1, 3, or 5. Uh, but that event B, rolling an even, 2, 4, 6. C, rolling a prime, 2, 3, 5. Okay, if you kind of forgot your prime numbers, okay, your first prime number is a 2, then 3, 5, right? Um, it's only divisible, evenly divisible by itself and, and 1, okay? So are the events A and B mutually exclusive? Well, let's take a look. Let me get my pen back out. Let's take a look. Do they have anything in common? We got nothing in common, so yes, they are mutually exclusive. How about A and C? Let's take a look. A, let's see, A and C, three and five looks like they have something in common between them. Okay, these uh, are not mutually exclusive. How about B and C? Yeah. Looks like two is common between them. Okay, so they are not mutually exclusive. So see what I. Hopefully you see what I'm saying there. Okay. 
So that's that definition there is going to help us out with some other future things. Okay. All right. Um, so like I said, we, de we define the event with a capital letter. And the easiest way to show various probability calculations is usually with a table, uh, two categorical variables, and uh, the well-defined outcomes for each. Okay. So let's say that this is uh, look at the student population for University of Akron. And let's say that we got 20,000 students, okay, in total. And we separate the, uh, the students between living on campus and their sex, okay? And so uh, here, this 4,800 represents, uh, well, I shouldn't say represents, but it's the number of people that, uh, that are male, okay, and what lives on campus. This 6,400 would be the number of students that are female and uh, lives off campus. Okay. Now you can add up the males, and you've got 10,400. Add up the females, 9,600. Okay. You can add up the uh, yeses and the noes. You get a total of 20,000. So notice to get this 20,000, either you would add up these guys here, or you would add up these guys here. Don't add them both. Okay. If you added all four of those numbers, you would count everybody twice. So let's say that we're trying to figure, uh, let's say that we're uh, defined M as selecting male at random, okay? So the probability of male then, meaning the probability of selecting a male at random would be what? Well, we would, uh, we're looking at all 20,000 people, okay? Out of that group, how many are male? 10,400. So we got 10,400 divided by 20,000. We got 0.52 uh, or 52 percent. How about if we looked at uh, Y, selecting the person that lives on campus at you know at, at random, and so the probability of Y would be what? Well, we would go to its total here of 8,000 divided by 20,000. What did we get? We got 0.4 or 40 percent. Okay, and so um, when we look at these, uh, just these individual uh, single events like male or female or no or yes living on campus, uh, we go to the subtotals and divide it by the total number. Okay, notice my denominator out of 20,000. Okay, that's not the case for every probability though, as we'll see. So we have an idea of a conditional probability. The notation for conditional probabilities is the following. So it's the probability of B with this line straight up and down, A. Okay, and I gotta, you know, tell you that that and, and warn you, okay, that that sign right there is not a division sign. Is not a division sign. Can't stress that enough. Okay, it's not a division sign. It stands for the word given, and so. We would say then probability of B given A. Probability of B, event B, given event A. What does it mean by this phrase? What does it mean by the phrase given A? Well, what it means is that event A has already happened before event B happens. Event A, even though it's shown last, actually happened first. This we know has happened. Or we assume that it happened, okay? Uh, here, that, that's not going to occur. That assumption part is not going to occur until intro two when we talk about hypothesis testing, okay? But here in this, when you see probably B given A, A has already happened. So we have some, oh, if you will, um, some update information, up-to-date information, okay? We have some upfront information about some stuff. What do we know? A has occurred. But here's the thing, is that um, what's going on here is that, therefore, we are still trying to figure out the probability of event B. Just that, knowing that A has already occurred. So we're still trying to figure out the probability of B, given A, given A has occurred. Okay? Can't stress that enough. We're still trying to figure out about the probability of event B. All right, so let's say that we go back to our data table. Let me move it up. And let's say that we try to figure out the probability of y given f. Okay, and so what's happening here is the following. We know that event 
female has happened, meaning that we picked a person at random and we know that the person's sex was female. We know that about the person. Okay? It's already happened. We already have that prior knowledge. Okay? Then that's an absolute. Okay? And so the, another way of saying this, uh, the probability of Y given F, is you could say the percentage of females that live on campus. Of females means basically that we're just going to look at that group right there. Okay? Given F. Given F. Percentage of females. Okay? And so the given F means that we are just looking at that group. So that means we are just looking at that group right there. Okay? And so um, out of that group of 9,600, okay, how many lived on campus? Looks like 3,200. So we got 3,200 divided by 9,600. That's a, that's a third. It's going to what be point three repeating in your calculator. So you could put point three repeating in calculator. But if we did this in WebAssign, I'll probably say, oh, around the one or two decimal places here. I rounded to one decimal place and we would put 33.3%. Good enough. Okay. Um, so conditional probability. Let's go over another one. Let's say that we're looking at the probability of n given m. So how the males group? What is the percentage that live on camp that that lives on campus? Okay. So what does that mean? We are looking at since this is the given part, given m, we are just looking at the males, and so we are just looking at the 10,400 people. So out of that group of 10,400. How many are living off campus? It looks like 5,600. So we have 5,600 divided by 10,400. We get this point uh, 538 number or 53.8 percent number. Okay. So when you have a given, okay, given m or given y, so you have a conditional probability. We aren't we are not looking at the total sample size then. We are just looking at that group right there because we know that about the person or, th or thing for that matter, okay? How about probability of M given N, okay? So no, in living uh, on campus, so they live off campus, right? Out of that group, what percentage are males? Let's take a look. So here's our data table again, and uh, again, we're not looking out of the 20,000. We're just looking at the no group, given no, given that we know this about the person. Okay, so that means when we're looking at the 12,000. So out of that 12,000, how many uh, are male? Looks like what? 5,600. So it would be 5,600 out of 12,000, and we get uh, you know you can see the answer there. So I want to point this out to you guys. Notice the probability of M given N is equal to 0.46 repeating. The probability of N given M is something different. Okay, it's something different. All right. And so, um, you know, there's some uh, things in math where you can flip things around. For instance, like addition, you can say 2 plus 3. And you can flip around and, and 3 point. 3 plus 2 is still going to give you 5, right? But you can't do that with subtraction. Okay, 3 minus 1, not the same as 1 minus 3. Okay, here, you can, you can, in general, you cannot flip these and you're not going to get the same answer. Okay, so in general, the probability of B given A is not equal to the probability of A given B. It could, okay, but generally speaking, it doesn't. Okay, that's not going to happen. Okay. Last thing that I want to talk about, okay, stick with me. This is important, okay? Or maybe if you got to uh, uh, stop the video here, fine. Uh, but this is the last part, this, this is the last section for part one, okay? Independent versus dependent events. So I have an example for you, and I'm going to make this a little bit more fun than just looking at numbers. Eventually we'll look at numbers, but um, we're going to make this a little bit more fun. Let's say this is a, this is a, a streets right here, okay? And we are... Uh, driving this way on the street, okay? And so here's our car, okay? And we're moving that way, and there's a red light right there, okay? And what just happened is this. 
is that we're not quite to the intersection yet. We still got a little bit of ways to go, okay? And uh, it just turned from yellow to red, okay? Now we have to make a decision, okay? I've been seeing a lot of people lately just blowing right through the through that light, okay? Um, uh, but you see the scenario that we're going through, okay? So we're still 120 feet away till we get to the middle of the intersection. We're driving 40 miles per hour, so it's going to take us a full two seconds, okay, to get through uh, to the middle of the intersection. So driving 40 miles per hour, go about 120 feet, and there you go, okay? It's going to take us about two seconds. Uh, and this is a 25 mile per hour zone. Okay. Let's assume the student stated, the, uh, oh, let's say that, uh, so what happens here is in class, I would say, what's the probability that you would go through that light? And I would just choose somebody at random. Okay. And let's say that I chose a female and she says, the pro oh, probably a, it's a 50-50 proposition. 50% 50, 50 of the time I'm going to uh, stop 50% of the time, I'm going to go through it. Now, what you got to consider here is that um, you got to go through all the scenarios. Maybe maybe you would say, oh, I go through it 100% of the time. Well, that's not true. If, if you had a person, I, I didn't tell you that, um, uh, what you got to think of is that, that, remember, this is probability, okay? And so, um, in other words, that uh, this has to cover all the bases, meaning I didn't tell you it was snowing. I didn't tell you it was nice out. I didn't tell you there was a person right in front of your car that has a red, that has a cane that has a red tip to it, and 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 dark glasses on, going across the street. Okay, I didn't tell you that there was a, a twelve puppies going across the street. You know, and so you know there are going to be times that we will stop. Okay, but let's say that this person said fifty percent of the time I will stop, fifty percent of the time I will go through it. Okay, so. Define that as event B. Probability of B, meaning she goes through the light, is 0.5. Okay? All right. So now, let's say that we add a little bit to this. Let's say that there's a police officer sitting right there, and, and the person driving the car recognizes this fact and sees the police officer sitting there. Now I ask the student, what's the probability that you go through the red light now? Okay, and you know that police officer sitting there looking for people to go through that or through that light. Maybe it's a, considered a dangerous intersection. Okay, so notice that A event A is that she spots the cop. She spotted the the police officer. Okay, so the probability she goes through the light. Okay, so notice we're still worried about event B. Still event B. We're still worried about the probability that she goes through the light given she spotted the cop. She spotted the police officer. Okay, turned out to be 0.01, let's say. Okay, so what happened to the probability? It changed. It changed when we introduced event A into uh, the scenario. So when event A occurred, it changed the probability of B around, okay? Notice B by itself is 0.5, okay? But if she spots the cop, nope, probability goes down, okay? Now, I just want you to note that it has changed. It went from 0.5 down to 0.01. It's changed. That's the important part, okay? So, uh, like I said, once you've been... Uh, event A happened, it changed the probability of B. In other words, the probability of B does not equal the probability of B given A. That has everything to do with what we're going to talk about here. Okay. Um, so I already said all that stuff. Yep. Okay. This is an example of dependent events. The probability of going through the light depends upon if she spots the cop first. Okay. In other words, the probability changes. Okay. Let me say that again. The probability going through the light depends upon if she spots the cop. It changes the probability. So two events are considered dependent if mathematically. Now, I don't. when I ask you this on the test, if I ask you such things, 
please don't give me an opinion about something. Okay, uh, you got to show me mathematically what's going on. Okay, so two events are considered dependent if mathematically. Okay, the probability of B does not equal the probability of B given A. Okay, so if we could show this, all right, that means events A and B are dependent. Two events are considered independent if mathematically we can show that they are equal to one another. Okay, meaning the probability of B is equal to the probability of B given A. So we're not saying the probability of B is equal to the probability of A. We're saying once A occurs, does that change B around? Okay, notice we're still consider we're still considering B here. Okay. Um, and that's what I just said there. All right. You flip a fair coin twice. Okay. We'll define B as getting a tail on the second flip. We'll define A as getting heads on the first flip. Okay. And so um, the probability of B is 0.5. Well, notice that does it matter what we got in the first flip? Is that going to change the probability of getting tails on the, on the second flip right here? Is it going to change the probability of the, of, um, so notice A occurred, okay? So, okay, we got, we got heads on the first flip, but does that change the probability of B around? No, it's still what? 0.5, okay? So the probability of B is equal to the probability of B given A. And since that's the case, that's why we say the flips are independent of one another. It doesn't matter what happened in the past, okay? It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It's not going to affect the, the future here, okay? So it doesn't matter if uh, we've got heads or tails on that first flip, okay? It's still a 50-50 proposition on the second flip, and it's still going to be a 50-50 proposition on the thousand flip, flip, okay? It doesn't matter what happened in the past. Okay, so we have... Um, I don't know why we, oh, okay, I need to bring up my data table. So let's say that we go figure out the probability of F, okay? And uh, the reason why we're doing this is because we're answering the question, are the events female and no independent or dependent? So are the events female and no independent or dependent? So we got to go ahead and figure out then the probability of F, and we got to go figure out the probability of F given N, okay? And so let's go ahead and do that. So notice we got to figure out if these are equal to one another or not. Okay. So this, so in other words, are these equal or not? That'll tell us if they're independent or dependent. Okay. So I don't know why my data table keeps on going away. Sorry about that. So the probability of F. Let's see. Probability of F. We got 9,600 females out of 20,000. So we got 0.48. Well, we got to figure out now the probability of F given N. Okay. So, probability of F given N. So, given N, so out of that 12,000, how many are female? 6,400. We figure that out, we get 0.533. Well, these two are not equal to one another, are they? They're different. Okay. Since the probability of F is not equal to the probability of F given N, the event's female and not living on campus are dependent because they're not equal to one another, okay? Not equal to one another. So you've got to figure these guys out. Okay, let's let's answer this question. Are the, are the events female and no independent or dependent? So uh, let's go ahead and figure out the probability of no. So the probability of no, what? 12,000 out of 20,000, that's 0.6. Probability of n given f. So given F, right, out of this 9,600, no, 6,400, that's 0.667. So the probability of no does not equal the probability of no given F. The events female and not living on campus are dependent. Because mathematically, we can show that, um, that they are not equal to one another. Now, um, a lot of times, notice what we did here, that we figured out the uh, probability of no and the probability of no given F, okay? So that's great. Students ask me, though, would it have mattered if I chose 
f, okay, as the first probability to take a look at. And I looked at the probability of f given n. And my answer to that would be no, it wouldn't matter. That's going, it's not going to give you the same numbers, but it's going to give you the same result, meaning uh, it will either show that they're independent or dependent. Okay, so let's, if you take a look at probability of f, okay, that turned out to be uh, 0.48. Probability of f given n turned out to be 0.53. Notice that there's a difference here. Okay, there's a difference between these two numbers, so they're not the same as the numbers up here using n as the first and then figuring n given f, okay, but they give you the same result. They are not equal to one another, okay, and these are dependent. So it doesn't matter which way you go with it, okay? Um, doesn't matter which event you start with, okay? It's going to give you the same result. Okay, now, uh, here's, a, here's a second example. I've changed things around. Uh, I have rank here, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and again, sex, males, and females, okay? And there's our numbers now, okay? I've changed things around a little bit. Uh, this is a little different than um, our males and females before. I got 10,000 here and I got 10,000 here. I did this on purpose just to show the, this, this example here. So the question is, are the events junior and females independent or dependent? Okay, so let's go figure out the probability of junior. Junior, 7,000 out of 20,000. That turns out to be 0.35, okay? Okay. Let's go figure out then the probability of junior given female. So let's see, given female, so out of the 10,000, okay, how many uh, junior, let's see here, um, how many juniors did we have? That's right, be 3,500. So 3,500 out of 10,000, that's 0.35. They're equal to one another, okay? And so the probability of junior is equal to the probability of junior given female. So the events female and being a junior are independent of one another. Okay, it doesn't matter if you uh, took a look at it in total, okay, or if you just looked at it in terms of females. It doesn't change the probability of junior. Okay. And again, you can flip these around and make female the first one. Okay, if you look at females first, you got 10,000 out of two, uh, 10,000 out of 20,000. That's 0.5. Then females given junior, okay, that would be 3,500 out of 7,000, that's 0.5, since they're equal to one another, independent, okay? So uh, this is important, uh, independent and dependence, okay, and showing this mathematically. All right, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll pick up part two uh, with the next slide, uh, but in the, um, the, uh, uh, the next lecture. Thank you.